You are listening to WCAT Radio, your station for quality Catholic programming. Your selected program will begin right after a word from our sponsor, Group M7.com, a web design and hosting company. Log on to Group M7.com today and let them know that WCAT Radio sent you. You know, my finest childhood memories was the Saturday morning movies for about four bits each. My brother and I could split a Coke and a big box of popcorn and watch movies about Tarzan, Jane, and their Amazon River adventures. Well, maybe that's where Jeff Bezos took his name. His Amazon.com is now the largest online retailer in the world. I'm Michael Malfood with Group M7, the oldest and largest website design firm in East Texas. And here's my point. And as usual, it's a good one. If your website is modern and up-to-date, mobile and search engine friendly, it matters not whether you sell a product or provide information about your goods and services. Your sales justifiably will increase just like theirs. The world uses the Internet. We can improve your website and your email. Look at our giant portfolio at groupm7.com. Since 1995, there's only one web and there's only one group, and it's us. It's Group M7. You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hey, welcome. If you, if you know Mary, you know Jesus. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Cantoni. I'm with my co-host, Robert. Hello there, Robert. Hello, Robert. Just say hello for now. And uh, But I'm so glad to be back, and uh, we're going to continue with our series on the Ten Commandments. Tonight is the Fifth Commandment. This show is If You Know Mary, You Know Jesus, my great joy, my mission, I believe, in in large part, is to make Mary known and loved. What a great advocate we have in before God in heaven. You know, it came to my Robert and I were just talking earlier, you know, how Mary, uh, she, you know, if you think about it, full of grace, hail full of grace, she contains the fullness of the Holy Spirit, a meaning all of God's power, grace, and mercy is contained in Mary the vessel. Every bit of God. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? And, uh, you know, but God is infinite. We've got to put this in perspective. He is infinite. Mary's finite. But there is no one that has more capacity for the fullness of God than Our Lady. No one. Not all the angels and saints put together. And it's clear in Scripture that Mary said, do whatever he tells you. And she did whatever he told her. She did whatever he told her. And Mary's saying, well, do whatever he tells you. So basically, Mary never deviated from the will of God ever, nor will she ever deviate from the will of God, completely united with the will of God. So whatever Mary wills, you can be assured it's God's will. So we look to Mary, and God made it, he made himself, what's the word? He submits to every one of Mary's requests. He does not refuse any request from his mother. Any. So what a great advocate we have in her and those graces that would Jesus would otherwise refuse outside of Mary. Well, now he gives it to us through Mary as consecrated soul. That's one of the benefits of being consecrated, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Whatever graces, how big or small, provided it's according to God's will for our good of our souls and the glory of God, she will obtain it for us. And if you think about it, uh, the, uh, the wedding party at Cana, she says, son, we have no wine. And Jesus says, well, woman, meaning he's referring to the woman that God the Father prophesied in the book of Genesis. I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed, Jesus Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And Mary said, do whatever he tells you. And if you read the full context, they did whatever. He he told them, and he changed water into wine. He performed his first miracle. So Mary has the power to change God's will. Can you imagine? Jesus said, my hour didn't come. But Mary requested, and Jesus said, so be it. Think about that, folks. Think about that. What a great advocate we have in the great mother of God and truly seek to consecrate yourself to her immaculate heart and she will obtain for you graces and mercies and blessings, floodgates for you. It's that simple. So that's the thought for the day. 
And um, again, uh, Robert is going to share with us the beautiful meditation and teaching in the spirit of St. Francis on the Fifth Commandment. Before we do that, I, uh, I, I want to bring to attention the uh, catechism on the Fifth Commandment, You Shall Not Kill. It's very important that we all take a look at the Catholic catechism and read it especially on the commandments. It is the teaching of the church and what we must abide by. Next to the scriptures, next to the gospel, next to the holy, God, holy word of God is the Catholic catechism, folks. Do not neglect it. So nevertheless, we'll begin with a prayer before we get to all that. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse, the Immaculate Mother. We thank you and we praise our Almighty God with all the love in our hearts for giving us such a good mother, a good advocate, a great teacher, a wonderful, wonderful friend. And we ask you, dear Mother, to overlook this show, Robert and I, give ourselves to you as your instrument to run this show as you see fit for the greater glory of God, for the good of souls, and the good of the church. St. Joseph, this is your year of terror of demons. We need you, St. Joseph, to inspire all the men to not be like Adam and just let his wife do whatever she wanted. He let Eve rule the world, basically. She, the devil tricked her into thinking you will be like gods, deciding for yourselves what is good and what is evil. And Adam, by sin of omission, let that happen. She became ruler of the world, basically. She became a, like a god in her mind, and then she gave to her husband Adam, and he took an eight, and he became a god in his mind. question is, how is that working for us? So we ask you, St. Joseph, to be that inspiration to all these men so that they become the heads of the family and the heads of the church, especially with our shepherds, and uh, do God's holy will and not the will of, of the evil one who wants to destroy families and the church. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we'll begin with the catechism. And the fifth commandment, you shall not kill, it begins like this. You have heard it. You have heard that it was said to men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Of course, that's Jesus. And got Matthew's Gospel, Matthew 5, verse 21 through 22. You shall not kill, and Jesus enhanced the commandment, You shall not kill. He made it even better. And deeper. Then it goes on to say, human life is sacred because from its beginning it involves the creative action of God. All right? That's very important. God creates the soul at the moment of conception. And you will see, and even, even in scripture it says, Before I knew you, before I knitted you in your mother's womb, before I knitted you in your mother's womb, meaning knitting the flesh with all the cells dividing. I knew you before I knitted you in your mother's womb. Wow. From all eternity, God knew us. So it's no small matter. A human life is very, very valuable to God. We're his children. So God, creative action, it remains forever in a special relationship with the Creator, who is its sole end. God is our end. God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning until its end. God alone. We don't decide what we think is good and what is evil, like Adam and Eve did. That's what the devil tricked them into thinking. If we decide it's good to terminate and abort our children, then who's being God here? Who's being God? If politicians sign into law abortion laws that permits abortion across the board, procured abortion, where millions of innocent unborn babies are terminated in the mother's womb and it's made law well then who's being God here who's deciding what is good and what is evil here you see how twisted and how upside down this is God is the one the Lord of life and God alone will determine who lives and who dies not us human beings 
So God alone is the Lord of life from its beginning until its end. No one can under any circumstance claim for himself the right directly to destroy an innocent human being. That says it all. Under no circumstance. That's why abortion and murder of the innocent is an intrinsic evil. Under no circumstances is it ever permissible. Doesn't matter. I can't have any excuse. Money. Oh, I'm going to school. Oh, I can't afford it. Uh, my parents are forcing me to have an abortion. My boyfriend's forced. Under no circumstances. So what do we do in these situations? We look to God for help. He gives us help. Look to the Sisters of Life in Washington, D.C. Contact them. Contact the missionaries of charity. They will help you. They will help you with your pregnancy. And they will help you to avoid abortion. And then maybe perhaps find an adoption agency or whatever. There is help out. There is alternatives to abortion. I want to make that clear. There is alternatives. Yes, it may be a little difficult. But this is a human life we're talking about. And God will bless you in your efforts, guaranteed, guaranteed. So I will, um, I will let, uh, let's, let me just do one more uh, reading from the Catholic Catechism. All right, so it says, Witness of sac Sacred History. In the account of Abel's murder by his brother Cain, Scripture reveals the presence of anger and envy in man, consequences of original sin from the beginning of human history. Man has become the enemy of his fellow man. God declares the wickedness of fratricide. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. So God is uh, trying to protect us from uh, um, the, the effects of original sin, the effects of our first parents who the devil tricked into thinking that it's okay to decide for yourself what is good and what is evil. You see? One more uh, reading here. This is on abortion, number 2270 from the Catholic Catechism. It says, Human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception, from the first moment of his, his or her existence. A human being must be recognized as having rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent being to life. If you and I have a right to life, then so do unborn innocent children newly conceived to, the, to, to their whole life on earth they have a right just like you and I and you and I have no right to decide whether that child lives or dies because I believe that is good or more and moral before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intrinsically wrought in the depths of the earth. And that's taken from Psalms. Uh, well, the first one was Jeremiah 115, also Job chapter 10, 8 through 12, and Psalms 20 through 22, verses 10 through 11, and Psalms 139, verse 15. So this is all scriptural. This is all scriptural, and the word of God is, is holy and true. All right, I am, um, I'm going to end it there, and I'm going to let Robert have the floor and give us the beautiful teaching on the fifth commandment in the spirit of St. Francis. Thank you, Robert. Okay, sure, Robert. Um, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Fifth Commandment. The Fifth Commandment of God reads, Thou shalt not kill. Many people believe that this commandment is simple and only has one direct meaning. This is false. For there is more to this commandment than the actual act. When one desires to journey to the kingdom of heaven, they must know what God demands. 
Many people claim to seek the kingdom of heaven, yet many times they act as if God does not exist. God demands and many refuse to listen to what he demands. God demands from all of us obedience, yet many live in disobedience. God demands all of us to love, yet many times hatred comes from people's hearts. God demands all of us to be generous, yet many times we become selfish. God demands patience from all of us, yet many times we become frustrated with impatience. God demands all of us to remain faithful and to be strong in our faith, yet many times we become slothful. God demands all of us to be docile, which means to be teachable, yet many times our pride keeps us from it. It is important that God becomes the most important part of our lives, and we must listen to what he has given to us. We need to listen to what God expects of us in his commandments. God demands in his commandments obedience. God is so gracious that he generously gives us the path to the kingdom of heaven, the Ten Commandments. God is all deserving of our respect, honor, love, and obedience as he commands much from us in this fifth commandment. The responsibility of every brother and sister under the commandment, thou shalt not kill, is to live a virtuous life. Reflect upon this simple story. Once there was a man who spoke to his brothers and said, What does thou shalt not kill mean? The brother was hesitant in answering this question. He said to the man, Does not this mean when we, we should not take another's life? The man said to him, And in how many ways can one take another's life? He replied to the man. I see that God is inspiring you with this question. Please allow him to teach me through you about the fifth commandment, he told the brother. My brother, there are two... My brother, there are two forms of death. One is physical and the other is spiritual. It is easy to know the first death that you can cause with anger as your guide, but the second death, the death of the spirit, is far more difficult to recognize in one's life. Reflect, my brother, on the story. I will tell you. For then perhaps you will understand the second death more clearly. There were seven children who became friends at an early age. The parents of the children saw their friendship and were pleased the parents sent the children to the same school, and their friendship grew even stronger. These children did not lack faith in God due to the love of their parents. When they entered the school, they all learned quickly, and their bodies were strong and healthy. They became popular, and many of the other students looked up to them. One day, a child with less ability came into their school. He, too, was raised to love God through the love of his parents. As he began to his studies, he learned slowly and had difficulties in reading, writing, and in math. He also struggled to learn. On seeing this, the seven children whose friendship was strong began to ridicule him, and as they did this, the other students joined in also. The boy, on receiving this criticism, found the spirit inside him beginning to die. He did not understand how people could be so cruel. Although the seven children were reprimanded for what they had done, they continued in hidden ways to ridicule him. Many times he would journey home trying to hold back the tears, but the emptiness inside him would cause him to cry. Eventually, this child began to feel worthless and unloved as God watched the seven friends killing the spirit of the one whom he loved. He set aside a portion of punishment for them within their life. And without reconciliation, they would be found unfit for the kingdom of heaven. 
The poor child who was ridiculed began to despise his life and desire to die. As the ridicule continued, he detached himself from all things, including our glorious God. His mother, who loved God, cried out to God, If only my son was treated decently by his peers, perhaps he would have never entered into such despair that he is in. The good mother began Beg, the good mother begged God to help her son in the difficult times that he was experiencing. The child who was ridiculed began to lose all hope and he began to fade into complete loneliness. His mother would enter his room at night and holding with tears of sorrow streaming down both faces. Both faces. Though his mother embraced, comforted him, it did not remove the wounds that were afflicted upon him. Thus, his life was still filled with emptiness. There came a time in his life that he felt that he could journey no further. In his desire to end the suffering in his life, there was only one solution to end this journey, and that, was, that would be to sin against the fifth commandment by taking his own life. The great mother from heaven knew of her child's suffering and came to him with her unconditional love and restored his soul with the grace of God. He had great gratitude towards her and he thanked her for her kind love and for saving his life. The great mother of God spoke unto him, My dear child, it was not so much the love that I have given to you that you must be thankful for but you should give great thanks to the one who has sent me, for it is the Almighty God who has felt your suffering and has blessed you with the light of faith that you have received. Now, my child, you must go in peace knowing that the Father in heaven dearly loves you and shall be there for you at all times. When the man was done speaking with his brother, the brother bowed his head in shame for he realized the errors in which he was living. For many times he ridiculed other brothers in the community for their faults, not seeing his own faults and how his words of ridicule were displeasing to God. He graciously thanked God for speaking so clearly through this man's love. Many in today's societies have experienced the darkness of this poor child in the story. God sees our hearts in these times and he sends us blessings that will make us whole again so that one day we all can have joy in the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. But we must not com contemplate on the suffering of our lives, but we also must contemplate upon the sufferings that we have caused. How many times have we spoken against another? How many times have we been unkind with our words and actions leading one away from the, their responsibility. The word of a man can steal the spirit of one who is weak. It is, it, if there was a flood and your friend fell into the water of death, would you turn your back on them as if, they, as if you never knew them? And because of this, your friend was washed away from you to their death. Words can also flood the heart with poison, causing spiritual death to even those who you love. Is there any one of us who could stand in faith unto death? So it is important that we all be gentle with one another and be generous with our words, actions, and self. Though everyone is called to be strong witnesses, we would not want to be found killing the heart of one who could already be so near death from their lack, from his lack of spirituality. In the story, it was not said what kind of punishment that seven friends received. However, we can be assured that they received their portion. Excuse me, their portion of, for their, their cruel, cruelty. So it is important when we seek to assist 
another along the path that leads to the kingdom of heaven, that our hearts permeate kindness, that our hearts permeate love and dignity for them, that our heart permeates respect and humility. But above, but above all, blessed are we when we utilize our love to comfort those afflicted children like the poor child in the story. For blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. For when a heart is pure, every commandment shall be a blessing, and it shall be a blessing to God. We should all be open to see the truth that many of us have been avoiding or blindly missing. Self-control and discipline are not options for any of us. Rather, they should be a way of life of us, a way of life. To live the commandments, we must have self-control and discipline. For with self-control and discipline, we will be able to fight off temptations and be able to conquer over those self-desires that displease God. Many times people overlook the responsibility of this commandment. They only see the outer portion of its meaning not the inner portion that dwells within it. It is our duty by this commandment to maintain our body, soul, and dignity with good health and with proper care, both spiritually and physically. The body is a necessary vessel that each of us has been blessed with. It is important that we take proper care of our own life, for in all reality, life does not belong to us. Life belongs to God. And without life, we would never come to be. Our glorious God blesses all of us with life, and he can take our life when he so desires. In the mystery of God, none of us know how long he shall bless us with life. So we need to utilize our life so it is pleasing to God and render unto God what is God's. Life is a blessing that must not be abused. So we must seek the better portion of life by loving God to complete obedience. Because life belongs to God, if one decides to take their own life in a final decision, being of sound mind, they commit mortal sin and are worthy of the fires of hell. For they are in violation of the fifth commandment. However, If one who is not mentally in control takes the life of their body, they shall not be held accountable for this act. It is also a serious sin to place yourself in risk of death for any useless reason, such as abuse of drugs and alcohol. However, when one is courageous and seeks with their whole heart to save another life in a time of crisis, and in doing it, loses their own life, it is not a violation of the fifth commandment, for there is no greater love than one who lays down their life for another. We must all understand that any habit that injures our health and could shorten the span of our life is a violation of the fifth commandment. For example, if one maintains drunkenness and allows it to destroy their life, both mentally and physically, they are in violation of the fifth commandment and are punishable by it. Some other habits that endanger our health and salvation are the following. One who eats in a gluttonous fashion, causing their heart stress that can shorten their life. This is a violation of the fifth commandment. We must not live to eat, but eat to live. We must be satisfied with a portion that keeps ourselves healthy rather than eating portions that could feed a family. Another habit is smoking. Though smoking in itself is not sinful, it can become sinful if it becomes an addiction that shortens one's life. When people make smoking a habitual lifestyle, knowing that it can cause sickness and disease to the body, and they do not take the proper care of their own health, life and health, this is a violation of the fifth commandment. Those who take drugs for pleasure that destroy the body, mind, and soul 
are in violation of the fifth commandment. We would, we would not want to be found abusing our bodies in any form or way when we come before Jesus Christ, for we shall be subject to his punishment. The world tempts us with many, many ways and the world tempts us in many ways and many people have addictions that destroy the body, causing their lives to be shortened. Thus the fifth commandment is violated upon self more than by injuring others. By the fifth commandment, we are all commanded to love and respect our neighbors and to live in peace and union with them. It is our duty to respect their rights and assist them in their spiritual life if necessary. We must impress, we must express concern for their well-being and act on our concerns when necessary. Many people in our nation today express hatred toward their neighbors, which is forbidden by the fifth commandment. Many speak in anger towards their neighbor, which is forbidden by the fifth commandment. There are even those who set revenge upon their neighbor, which is forbidden by the fifth commandment. We must understand that everything that could lead to murder is forbidden by the fifth commandment. It is important to understand that we can violate any of the commandments by speaking something or doing something that leads to the actual act of breaking the commandment. When one sets revenge upon another, they desire to injure another in retaliation. This is ungodly. Consider this. Did not Jesus Christ tell us that it would be good for us if one would strike us upon the cheek that we should offer them the other? Should we not forgive others as we wish God to forgive us? Contemplating revenge only demonstrates the spirit of darkness dwells within us. And you are in need, and we are in need, if we fall to this, in this we are in need of rec- the sacrament of reconciliation for violating the fifth commandment. Another violation of the fifth commandment is fighting. When one seeks to injure another by an act of unjust violence, they entertain the devil which brings him satisfaction that he is within their souls. When the devil can lead nations into wars, this brings him the greatest satisfaction considering many journey into battle without the remission of their sins. Many journey into battle without the Spirit of God within them. Though there are many Though there have been many just battles that have been fought, battles usually have an unjust side. Thus wars, though necessary at times, are in themselves evil and should be avoided at all cost. Another violation of the fifth commandment is all willful murders where one takes another's life with no regard for life. For those who kill without a repentant heart, there is no place for them in the kingdom of heaven. Hold on one second, Robert. One of the most horrifying violations of the fifth commandment is the abomination of of abortion. One who takes the innocent life of the unborn is worthy of the furthest depths of the fires of hell. The act of abortion is blasphemy to the highest degree. It is an act that shall never go unpunished. It is our duty to respect all life and to protect life from the moment of conception to the moment of death. We cannot stand in silence while the silent cries of the unborn are being torn from the womb of blaspheming mothers. God has spoken to us loud and clear. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. 
Abortion means death to all who believe in it. For one who believes in the abomination of abortion is in violation of the fifth commandment and is in need of repentance. Some people may say, but what if they do not know that it is wrong? Many of the faithful have made the world aware that it is an act of violence that murders innocent life. And, there, and this goes against the fifth commandment. Those who refuse to stand up for life live in the sin of omission. And it is punishable by the laws of God. Many in our society today feed upon greed and unjust anger, where their words, with their words, they can tear apart the lives of their neighbors. Because the world has forgotten the virtues of God, there are many abusing the gifts of God. There are so many scandalizing their neighbor, bringing great sorrow to heaven. We must never seek to kill the soul of another by scandal. The tongue can be a two-bladed sword that can kill the spirit, leaving one in complete darkness. Many in our world use the tongue to scandalize another. This must be, bring God great anger. Think of how many times we have spoken out in anger against another, many times not knowing that we are scandalizing them. Through our words, others can be drawn into spiritual death. We must understand that scandal is an expression of evil that leads others to do evil. We must be on guard and think before we speak, for we would not want to scandalize anyone for scandalizing someone is a grave offense against God. One might ask, what makes one enter into scandal? And the answer of this question, is, or this question is simple. It could be because of pride, envy, anger, jealousy, greed, and gossip. There, these are vices of death and have been seen in our world many times. One cannot point to another, for the finger should point upon our, ourselves. For, for we have all been subject to one or more of these grave sins. In the world today, there are many priests who are being scandalized. The devil knows that if he can scandalize the priest, the shepherds of God's lambs, the flock will be scattered, and the beast will have their feast upon the little lambs. Woe to those who scandalize against God's priests, for judgment shall fall upon them. Even many of our leaders of this nation are guilty of scandal, as they have established laws that lead to the destruction of morals and principles of God. Some laws built by man are a corruption of spirituality and protect the violation of this fifth commandment. For the law that protects the murder of innocent babies is, an ab is that as, as abomination. Hear the words of God. Whoever causes one of my little ones to believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. We must respect all life, for God is the author of life, and everything he has made is good and must be treated as such. By the fifth commandment, we must become peacemakers in the eyes of God, for this is the opposite of one who strikes out in vengeance, killing another. When some, something evil is revealed by God, one must seek the opposite by always doing good. St. Padre Pio said, If the world could see in the sky how many demons that belong to the devil that are here upon the earth, there would be, there would be so many that it would block out the sun. Our only protection is the grace of God. To obtain this grace, we must pray, fast, and do penance. We must visit the sacraments frequently, and receive worthily 
the blessed sacrament, which is our Lord Christ Jesus. Woe to the great Babylon who murders their children, for punishment shall fall upon their great nation for the violations of the fifth commandment. A nation that murders their unborn shall not stand and shall feel the wrath of Almighty God. In the midst of this nation burns a fire of evil that fuels the hearts of this nation with anger and bitterness. Many have begun to journey along the path of destruction, for they have been consumed by the devil who fills them with lies. Many hearts that once have been open to God now have allowed their souls to be darkened by this once great nation. It is not by the principles of the world that we must live, but by the principles of the Almighty God. Flee this great Babylon. Flee from her lust, anger, and death, and remain in the confidence of God so that he will bring us the guiding light of grace to see us through the difficult challenges that lie ahead for this nation. Love is the key that conquers over all trials and tribulations. Thus, when we love, we keep holy the fifth commandment of our glorious God. Amen. Amen. Stern words from my... I was even stern in the beginning, and for good reason, because God always starts out very strong with a warning. Always. You read Scripture. All the prophets in the Old Testament, you always start, this is what's going on, it needs to stop. But he also, God is also a God of great mercy, infinite mercies. But he's calling us to repentance, calling us to conversion, to have a contriteness, to say, God, I am sorry. If there are those out there that have had an abortion, or those who even murdered people, know that God is mercy is extended to you we just need to be reach out and get it but Jesus says I, I do not condemn you but he says go and sin no more so we need to work on ridding our lives of sins that cause destruction not only to our own souls our own self but to others around us it's really the gospel is an urgent call to conversion, repentance, and conversion. You know, but God's mercy is really the medicine for all of these ills, all of the sins that we have committed, for all of the anger, the desire or the, the um, temptation for, to commit abortion, or any sin, any of the sins, any of the deadly sins. God's mercy and grace is there to help us. And when we show God that we are serious about converting, God, I don't want to lead a life of sin anymore. I don't want any part of Satan and his kingdom and his evil. I don't want any part of abortion, any part of harming my neighbor. God, please help me. I guarantee you he will immediately extend his grace and mercy when he sees a sincere soul. And should we fall, should we fall, God's mercy will be available to you whenever you need it. Keep that in mind. But we have to avoid the sin of presumption. We can't presume that God I can do whatever I want and God's going to be merciful to me anyways. It doesn't work that way. He, we need to show him that we are sincerely repentant and we're willing to try. We have a desire to try to convert to change our ways, to live a life of the gospel, a life of, to live the Ten Commandments, I guarantee you all of heaven will rejoice at one repentance dinner. All of heaven, all the angels and saints. And God will extend his great mercy to you. Guaranteed. He is so merciful. He is so in love with you. Despite, he's so in love with all of us. Despite our sinfulness, our wickedness, our wretchedness, whatever it is. He just want, asks us to try and to turn toward him and ask him for his help, and he will give it to us. 
just want to make that very clear. His mercy and his help is there, especially in the sacrament of reconciliation. Not only do you receive God's mercy and love, you receive his forgiveness. The weight of the world will lift off of your soul. You'll feel so free because God is that's the only place that God, you can have guilt removed on earth. It's the only place. It may take years through psychotherapy, but God truly removes all instantly the guilt of our failings and sins, and then he gives us his grace and his mercy to make us stronger so we fight to not commit these sins again. You'll feel yourself becoming stronger and stronger. Let's say you've, you've, we've com you've committed a sin and you confess it. God will give you the grace, and then a little down the road you fell into that again because you got weak. Go back to confession, and God will give you the grace. But each time you do that with sincerity, you will get stronger and stronger and stronger, and eventually you won't have any, you'll be so strong, you won't commit those sins anymore. It's so simple the way God made it for us. But I hope I'm getting this message across um, clearly that God's mercy is infinite, it is miraculous, it is healing, he loves you, he loves you beyond measure. Just look at the cross. Just look at what God the Father, he sent his son to die for us and to suffer a horrible death so that he, could be, he can bestow on us his mercy. is there for the taking. So I guess um, I don't know what else to say, Robert. Uh, wonderful job. And uh, we pray for all of you uh, that God uh, will, will draw you into his infinite love, into his infinite mercy, and that your hearts will be open to receive it, to have that deep encounter with God's merciful love. In this way, you will discover how much you are loved, despite whatever we have done, you have done. Even if we have committed all the sins of the world from the time of Adam and Eve, there's no sin greater than God's infinite mercy. Remember that. He's always willing to embrace you with his mercy, just It just takes us to humble ourselves before his infinite majesty and say, God, I truly, I am sorry. Will you help me? I guarantee it. Guaranteed. He will well, never let you down. Any, any, any last thoughts, Robert? Yeah, what I'd like to, 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 to say is where it says here, um, uh, to obtain this grace, we must pray fast and do penance. We must visit the sacraments frequently and receive worthily the blessed sacrament, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And what came to me was, was uh, going to the traditional mass, um, uh, the Latin mass. Um, I, I, it was a while back, but I remember at one of these masses, there's like the, the post-communions and the extra blessings you can receive. And so I went and I read, and it, and it said, to increase your thanksgiving, praying to be able to increase your thanksgiving. And it would be a wonderful fast for most souls that receive our Lord, uh, and even if it's a penance, to stay there in thanksgiving. Because how else are we going to be sent unless we speak to God, know God, and yet, those 15 minutes after receiving our Lord are the most precious moments in our life, and yet everyone leaves. And our children witness something that's not of God, I have to say. And, and it might be because people don't know. So the accountability only God knows. But if you look at the state of our nation in the views on how many Catholics believe that Jesus is truly present in the most holy Eucharist, it should cause all of us to weep, at least in thanksgiving for what we have received and the grace to know that Jesus is there. But yet, we, we've mingled with, with this sorrow. It could be the greatest joy, but then our heart shouldn't be far from loving our neighbor back to God. So, so I think this is what's needed most in our church um, for that to be proclaimed wholeheartedly. And I went to a, com um, a confirmation this last weekend, and the bishop at the very end 
said something beautiful. And we prayed for the bishop with our prayer group, our St. Joseph prayer group, that the Holy Spirit would truly speak through him to these children. And he did. And he basically said that we're, that to be of the flesh of the world or to dwell with evil in any way, it's not for us, but to become saints. To become saints. And it is so very important for every father, mother, godparent, aunt, uncle, uh, all of us, to truly take it seriously about becoming a saint and um, to utilize the sacraments to the highest degree to maintain that, that, that saintliness um, and to enter into all the mysteries of God, all the devotions, our Holy Roman Catholic Church is the truly, it truly is the pearl of great price in the primary mass of the church, um, the traditional mass, um, I feel, uh, to the highest degree because it, 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 it savors every aspect of the traditions of the church, um, uh, the infant church that blossomed into, in, into the beautiful rose that it is, you know. So and I'd like to just leave you with that, Robert, and uh, may God bless you all. Thank you, Robert. Beautiful words. And, um, yeah, I think uh, we'll, uh, we'll close it out here. I just want to end with a few thoughts um, my experience, I remember uh, in the Right to Life March quite a few years ago, we would enter the senators' offices, of course, all the senators, knowing that it was the, uh, the 21st of January, uh, of January, the Right to Life March, they would all leave town. Not one senator would show up, not one. Can you imagine? So, but they left us with their assistants. And uh, I was in one of the senator's offices, probably Senator Dodd, uh, when he was senator. And, uh, you know, the assistant was very nice. She was um, cordial. She was, you know, doing her best to be pleasant and so forth. And, and uh, so, but I brought up this, the fact that, you know, uh, to, to express my outrage, I'm, I'm an Italian, I, I get emotional, for, so forgive me if I get overly emotional, but I express my outrage with my emotion. But nevertheless, I spoke with her, I says, you know, even a two-year-old knows that there's a baby in mommy's belly. A two-year-old. And you ask any two-year-old, they will say there's a baby in mommy's belly. So it's not rocket science. So I express it to her just like that. And this pleasant, kind woman, nice woman, all of a sudden got angry and very defensive and offensive. And she was no, more, no longer pleasant. I don't know what I said that hit a nerve. But I simply said a two-year-old knows that there's a baby in mommy's belly. So this pro-abortion woman, who was supposed to be so peaceful and kind, and according to her, nonviolent, became violent. And she was nasty to me, and she wanted me to leave. So uh, you, you tell me. Yeah, I, I must have hit a nerve because I'm speaking the truth. And the truth is like a two-edged sword. You know, our Lord said he came to be a sign to be contradicted. He was, the, he was the cause for the rise and fall of many in Israel. Why? Because he's the truth. But sometimes the truth is meant to cut to wake us up, to wake us up to the truth, because we are in de deadly danger if we violate the commandments of God, if they, especially if they go unrepentant. And Robert mentioned one beautiful thing, to become a saint. That's what the gospel is all about, put on the mind of Christ, become a saint. No longer I, but Christ live in me. I am dead to the world, the flesh, and the devil. I am dead to my own self-love. And Christ is the total and complete center of my entire being. That's what a saint is. One who does the will of God always, or at least strive to do the will of God. That's what a saint is. But once you become a saint, or once you are striving to become a saint, then God's mercy and power becomes in you. You become, he, he extends to you, all of his gifts and graces so that you can give it to the world. 
You see? And then you'll be a, a participant in God's healing ministry, in his mercy, ministry of mercy, and you will draw more souls to heaven through you becoming a saint. This is what it's all about. This is what God's desire is and why he gives us the commandments, gives us the gospel, gives us all that Jesus taught so that we can become, as St. Louis de Montfort says, the fullness of Christ's age on earth. Not wait for heaven, on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And a saint is one who does the will of God constantly, always. And, and should we and fall? Robert, sure, go ahead. And I'd like to say, too, on today's feast day especially, so very important, St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More. And we ask uh, Our Lady to smile upon them and intercede before the throne of God for all, for our Holy Father, and for all cardinals and bishops and priests and deacons, that they have the courage of St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More. Amen. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Come by means of the most powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse, and St. John Fisher, and St. Thomas More, and St. Joseph, and St. Francis. Amen. Amen. And I, would, I just want to remind everyone to please, um, if you haven't thought about it, please, if you can commit one rosary a day, just focus one rosary for the Holy Father and for all your bishops. Just pray a rosary and, and offer it to Our Lady for them specifically because they need us. They need our prayers. And we need them because they give us the Eucharist and they give us priests. Our bishops give us priests. The church can't survive. The world can't survive without priests because priests give us the Eucharist. So no priests, no Eucharist. And we need the Eucharist. So pray for all your bishops. Pray especially for the Pope and the bishops. And uh, you know, really with all your heart, pour out your heart to let Our Lady intercede for them and obtain for them all of the graces that heaven wants to bestow upon them for the good of the church and for the glory of God and the good of souls, for the good of souls. So I'll leave you with that, and I thank you all for listening, and I thank you, Robert, for joining us and, and give us the beautiful meditations and teachings. And uh, until next time, may God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Most Holy Trinity, bless you all and your families and your loved ones through the hearts of of Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. Amen. Good night, everyone. Amen. The mission of Holy Apostles College and Seminary is to form faithful witnesses of Christ. Year after year, the prestigious Newman Guide has recommended Holy Apostles for our academic excellence and steadfast fidelity to the magisterial teachings of the Catholic Church. We are also fully accredited and the leader in Catholic online learning. Our students enjoy the unsurpassed flexibility to study on their own time and anywhere in the world through asynchronous engagement. Holy Apostles is dedicated to the relentless pursuit of truth, which allows students in all academic programs, including undergraduate, graduate, and personal interest, to formulate a coherent worldview based on both faith and reason. The study of the liberal arts also develops and refines key competencies associated with career readiness, such as critical thinking and problem solving, clear communication, collaboration, and a strong work ethic. The tuition rate at Holy Apostles is one of the most affordable in the country. Yearly tuition for a full-time undergraduate is under $12,000. Students at Holy Apostles can graduate with minimal or even no college debt which enables them to live out their calling as faithful witnesses of Christ without heavy financial burdens holding them back. Please visit www.holyapostles.edu forward slash admissions for more information. The fall 2021 admissions deadline is Friday, July 23rd. Classes start Monday, August 30th. See you soon. Hello, God's beloved. 
I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.